Yeah, I think overall, the disconnect on where your food comes from and why that matters, and ultimately the outcomes that could be our future based on those lack of understanding and ignorance is very costly. And the pandemic has highlighted that more than anything in my lifetime. And it's finally got people speaking about it or questioning or at least having curiosity on more than just a label or a sort of certification or this fad diet or that asking some basic questions on, well, why do we do it that way? And when you start unpacking it, people are shocked. I have no titles after my name, Chad. So, you know, it's like Tyler Lorenzen. I graduated college, so I have that going for me, but Nicole's a PhD. So I always like to, I wish I had something like that. I don't, you know, MBA, PhD, n- none of that going for me. But Nicole is a, you know, biomedical engineer. So I like the little humble brother brag. You know, no big deal. Yeah. That's typically why I always get intimidated when I argue with her. Like, I know we're going up against that. Yeah. It, I'm just- a scientist. I'm an engineer. And that's how I approach life. That's for sure. That's how you would approach like laying out your business card and we would argue about it. <laughs> so for sure. So that's uh, that's why I wanted to do this first podcast with both of you on it. Because when you read about purists these days, first of all, I think it's important to talk about the evolution and in, in where purists came from. Because that name's only a few years old, but the business is decades old. But if you're reading about what Nicole's doing in the press, or if you're reading about what Tyler's doing in the press and you have never met Tyler and Nicole, you don't understand that it's this brother-sister duo standing up a big pillar of our food system. And more so, it's actually the Lorenzen family mm-hmm. who made a decision 30, so how many years ago did we start? 35. Okay, so, so Lorenzen family started 35 years ago. Mm-hmm. This family business, this also very specific skill set entrepreneur, Jerry, your dad. When the industry was going left, he just said, nope, I'm going to go right. And then since then, generations have taken over and helped the business kind of skyrocket. But as far as, you know, you hear about family businesses being stood up in the food industry, and I think it's a nice narrative to look at. But when you talk about the infrastructure part of it, rather than CPG brands, like the Siete family is Mm -hmm. an example, you don't think of a brother-sister duo standing up the food economy. So is that weird? I don't think it's, it actually is not weird to me at all. And and maybe the reason being is because we lived it. So when you you were talking about that, I, I reflect back to when we were just kids and it was something that I always dreamed was going to happen, but never really understood how big of an impact when you were a kid. Uh, The only reason why I believed it was going to happen is our dad literally every day would tell us that someday it's going to be bigger than you've ever imagined. And don't forget why we started. We started to feed people first. And when, when that choice comes to make another dollar or to feed people, always feed people first. And as you know, a 10 year old, a high school kid, a college kid, even in your 20s, you don't get it. You don't get what he's talking about. You don't get what he means exactly. And now as, you know, I'm 35, the business started when I was zero and I get it entirely now. And the sacrifices that Nicole made and my mom and dad made when I was just a kid to set us up for what is possible and really providing options for, to feed people into the future, not just tomorrow, but forever to build a sustainable food economy that actually works for everyone, all stakeholders. To me, it doesn't surprise me now that we're doing this together because it was built with intention and rooted in really our core that this is who we are and this is what we came here to do. And I give it all to my parents for, for instilling that belief that it's possible as a person to figure out a way to make it better and to do something bigger than yourself. And I think that to me is why Nicole and I joining forces as a brother sister duo here 
it makes all the sense in the world. Not to mention there's other family members, everyone's family at this point, because let's face it, you have to check your ego at the door at a growth business. And we all have to go at it together because there's so much to do and so many problems to solve. And that's, that to me is what it really is all about. Yeah, I would agree. I, you know, one of our core values is partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think that plays out in so many ways today, but it all boils down to, you know, our aspiration of a plant strong planet. That's been something that's been fundamental to how we've talked for my entire life. So that's something that's been instilled and it's it's so deep in the core of our business that it doesn't, it's not about our family, it's about the purpose and what we're trying to do. And so we're all just driving to that same, same place. I feel incredibly lucky to be able to work with my family, my brother, my husband works in the business too, Jordan uh, leads our grains division. And because you know that we're all pulling in the same direction and that's one thing you don't have to worry about is that we're all kind of, we're all going the same direction. And so there's that, that natural alignment, which is great. And the more we build out our culture and our team around this purpose, that is inherent with all of our team, not just the family members, everyone that kind of comes to work for Purus, more and more people are coming because of the purpose, not because of the, you know, the job title, but it's because they want to be a part of this, uh, this greater, this greater thing. And I think that's just really exciting. And it does make the family, I would say, take a back seat to the purpose, which is what which is what we want. I think that speaks volumes to the, as you mentioned, Chad, with the name of Puros. And you were very much on the forefront of of that. Where, you know, we had a bunch of different names for a bunch of different companies. And as a small business, 10 years ago, there was 30 employees. Now there's over 300 and growing. And our parents literally touched every single person that worked at, at Purus. And at the time, it was really easy to instill the values that the, the business was founded on. But as you scale, as you grow, the company, every person in the company won't touch Jerry and Renee, the founders of this. And they won't understand where it came from, what the journey was, and how hard it was to get where we're at, and why we made some of these sacrifices to set up our business and our farmers and the whole system to work at scale. And so that was one of the biggest reasons, and you helped me see that, why we needed to make a company that that stood for something and was easy to share with everyone that joined the business so we all knew exactly where we're going and the direction the business has. So when the founder's not around, when you, Chad, or Nicole is not around, it's very clear what decision to make because the direction we're going is crystallized and we're headed there you know, together. And the, the direction we're going to as far as feeding people first, and you hear that, I mean, you hear that every single day. So it's bouncing off the walls in the company. The, the things that we're doing, um, you know, I, I think it's eventually I want to get to the the different organizations that you both run. But the before that, it's almost like the reason for that is because this idea of plant based nutrition, uh, healthy lifestyle, the the whole idea for feeding people first, it is enormously complicated. It is not a black and white solution in the least. So I've, you know, since meeting you guys a few years ago, I've seen different organizations set up, um, joint ventures set up, major investors come in, just kind of navigating this part of the, the feeding people infrastructure is, it's a very, very intimidating battle. So the, you know, I do think that there's some benefit i know you don't want to talk about it too much nicole about the family thing but i'm going to <laughs> when when you become an organization of this size and i've had a lot of perspective in companies this big or even bigger the the ability to argue for something for a purpose gets more and more complicated as well and because you 
are both so driven towards the purpose that we're going, but you've been arguing for 35 years. So when you're talking, you generally don't understand how you're presenting yourselves in an argumentative you know, position, but it continues to invite the rest of the employees in. And I think that's what I've, I've seen this in another organization too, where it was a, this was a hundred year old business, family owned, run by different generations. And that was kind of the, the glaring factor. Like in any moment you could have a debate about something happening with the top of the company. And it was okay because I think there was a little bit more exposure to that and it's more welcoming. And I think that's, you know, when you're dealing with something really, really complicated, that's an advantage. You know, and it's very hard to like teach in a situation where you have new leaders coming in that don't necessarily know each other before. So that's, I get really excited about just continuing to invite new players, new leaders in different parts of our organization. But when they see that, you know, I hear, I've heard that internally too, as far as like, this is great. We can have a conversation, like a real conversation. Well, I think it's important because one of the, the, the things that we have to make sure we avoid is the, the, the family, if you will, we aren't the experts at everything. And if, if we are, then our company is limited to what we're good at, which is never going to be enough to really grow and have the impact that we're looking for. So when people are coming in the door at Purist, they, they represent a capability and a competence that we don't have. And we want people to shine and really bring all of their talents to the table to, to drive the business and the purpose forward. And so that means, you know, being willing to, to challenge the status quo and maybe the, the closely held beliefs so that we can get better. Cause it's all about how do we get better? And you know, we use a ton of sports analogies around here, but every day is not practice every day. We're playing the game and we have to show up every single day and play to win. And I think that's kind of the, the difference in business and, and sports is that you don't, there's not a lot of practice every day you're on. And, and so we have to all just show up and, and be ready to, you know, leave it on the field every day. So actually, I think that's a great sports analogy. The I'm pretty sure I stole it from Tyler. I think he said it before. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually thinking Tom, Tom Brady, I was listening to that, something he said, and he just won a Super Bowl this past weekend, seven of them, and yeah, TB12, hashtag P protein. But never never enough time to sell a little pea protein Chad. <laughs> but but he he said uh in his book he was talking about early on in his career how in college and early in pros that he treated every practice like a game because he wasn't the guy at michigan he wasn't the guy at the patriots to begin with so he said if if i don't treat every practice like a game the coaches will never put me in the game and that's so true to where we're at. If we treat our business as a growth company, as an underdog, as an outsider, like everyone else, we are for sure not going to make it up the hill we're trying to climb. But if we bring another level of energy, and I really think that energy and that focus and the resiliency is a reflection of our, my, our mom and dad, Jerry and Renee, and then, it, it obviously bleeds into how we are as a family in general. We argue all the time. We, every game we play, we're all trying to win. And John Getzinger, who, who runs our commercial team at Purist Proteins, he said that a lot of organizations, especially family businesses, reflect on how the, reflect the family in the end. And he said, this business is no different. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have a culture where you know, disagree and commit and debate and have the openness and willingness to be wrong, but also the conviction to fight for what you believe in so we can get to better answers. And it makes it way more fun if we all work hard at a goal that we're headed towards, win or lose, it makes it worth it. And that's to me is what how you make business like sports because it should be fun because we have all, we all can do whatever. Yeah. And it's competitive. Yeah, and it's got to be. Otherwise, it won't be worth it in the end. You know, so I think that to me is more, more I think about where my beliefs come from, the more I realize they're, my, they're shaped by in our family. Yeah. So 
just kind of to to create some clarity around this too because there's a you know i've actually worked to try and create clarity around the fact that you both have a title of ceo under the name purus i think it would be great to understand nicole like because i actually don't know the conversations that happened to get you to actually like stop a pretty successful career and come into the family business so maybe talk a little bit about purist holdings and how that starts to differentiate or work together with Tyler's business. Cause they are two totally different business units as far as their, their roles and responsibilities. Um, and even, you know, I guess business objectives, yeah. the goal is the same, but the, the requirement for multiple CEOs under purist, like why is that? Yeah. So I think from a high level purist, and regardless of what division or department or business unit we're talking about, Puris is an end-to-end -end sustainable food company, working all the way from development of genetics and seed, working with growers, ingredient transformation, product development, and sustainable food production. All of that fits under the Puris umbrella. And how we manage and structure our business is can be somewhat complicated, but it really enables the businesses to grow and scale interdependently. So independent, yes, but also together. And so Purist Holdings um, is contains our most legacy business, which we call, which is Purist Grains, and that deals with all of the genetic development. So the high performing uh, crops that are specifically developed for food purposes. That and we've been doing that for 35 years. That's how our business was founded. We are very grounded in the development of seeds. It's such a critical piece of our business. And that's really where our, our dad, Jerry, started. He was a soybean breeder. And he said, you know, he was working in his first job out of college uh, selling animal feed. And he had a moment where he said, people are going to need to eat plants. And the system isn't efficient. We're selling all of this grain to animals to then eat the animals. And someday people will need to eat more plants. So those those plants better taste good. And so he started in our basement developing soybean genetics breeding because that was his summer job when he was in college playing football. During the summer, he was a soybean breeder. And he started that very, very humble beginnings and uh, eventually quit his job and a couple years later and full time, this is what we did. And our first test plot was in our garden at our house. And my babysitter was our first uh, soybean breeder. And what, can maybe explain what a test plot is as well. Cause I so, think that's a, that's an important subject that someone of your background probably moves right past. Yeah. Um, when you're developing seed genetics, you have a bunch of different varieties, you know, it's, they're like little babies. So you, you take two parents and you make, um, baby seeds and then you have to plant them and really test them against each other. So a test plot contains hundreds, thousands to tens of thousands different varieties that we're, that we're looking at to see which ones are gonna perform for our food system, perform for our farmers so that they can grow and yield and also turn into to great food. So that um, you know, started in our basement, went to our garden. Today we have test plots um, all around the US and, and all around the world. So it's pretty exciting to see that growth, but the, you know, the foundation is the same. We're still looking for the best genetics that can really perform for our food system. And so that's what our business has always been doing. And from my childhood, that was a heavy part of my life because um, our company was very small. It was my parents and Tyler and I and a couple other people here and there, but we did a lot of the work ourselves. And, and so I was a soybean breeder for most of my life. That's what I did. And so when I was young, I said, I'm going to be an engineer and I pursued, pursued that. And so when I was working in the medical device industry, at that time, our company was still pretty small and we were really focused on, uh, I would say some com more commodity processing. That's kind of where our business was. And that's when Tyler joined the business. And so he started really looking at transforming Purist from a, uh, I would say a more regional, smaller scale player, and how can we play a bigger role in the global food transformation and really started um, bringing pea protein to life, making a, a product that people would actually want to eat. And over the, I would say about four years, 
every time we would get together, you know, I'm in the medical device industry doing what I had always dreamed I would do, uh, loving my job and life. Uh, he would say, someday you're going to come work for Purist and you're going to help create all these new food products. And I would kind of just laugh because I was doing what I loved. And, you know, years passed, years passed. And I, the company I was with went through a couple acquisitions and the product I had been working on was commercialized. And then we got acquired again. And so I had a moment in time where I was really committing to this really large corporate career path, or I could go work for PRS, my family business and, and help scale it. And I had this moment where I said, what if I don't, I will regret it for the rest of my life. I was like, I can't not do it. I have to at least try having no idea if it would go well. Um, cause it can also be a challenge, but that was the best decision I have ever made because I get so much, um, just joy with working with my family, but also just so much gratitude for believing so strongly in what we do that it's a very fulfilling, you know, my days are fulfilled, um, just from a, from a value. I feel like my value cup is definitely being, being filled. So ultimately Tyler was right. Uh, he told me well before I joined the company what I would be doing. And lo and behold, here we are many years later. And these are some of the projects that he was spitballing. If anyone knows Tyler, knows that he does that, uh, are coming to reality. And they're the, the transformative, you know, really innovative products that we're, you know, looking to bring to market in the next 12 to 24 months. So it's really exciting. And yeah, he's, he has a, he had a little bit of a prophecy there. I got chills like multiple times there. It, the, the story to me, Chad, is I love hearing Nicole tell it because from my perspective, a little bit different. So not the result, everything's true. Yes. But it was from a perspective where I've always idolized Nicole always my whole life. And I went to Iowa state. She was already there. And I finally, I transferred out of Iowa state and went to a different school. And it was the first time where I was like, you know, actually paving my own wake and doing my own thing. And when I joined Puris, it was one of those things where I knew Nicole was the best person that could help me because she knows all my faults and all my strengths and she can cover up for all of those shortcomings better than anyone that I knew because I just knew her better than anyone. And I was, I knew that she just couldn't come join the business at any time that we needed to earn our way to be good enough to have her join and be in a place where she would be able to step in and go. And I'll never forget. I said, Nick, I always call her Nick. And then people tend to do that in meetings. And I'm like, Nicole, uh, I was like, your job is to do what I helped dad do. It's like we took the business and we leaped it to the next. And dad's always said, it's not about innovation. It's about leapfrog events. You can't just make subtle improvements. You need to literally leap yourself further than, than the competition. So they have to chase you and then do it again and do it again and do it again and never stop. And that's how you continue to build innovation into your business without the standard curve of growth to consolidation to decline. And I said, that's what you're going to do. You're going to make a business way bigger than purest proteins. And it's going to be awesome. And you're going to make plant-based food, just like dad always said we would. And like, that's what you should do. And it, Nicole's different because if you oversell her, she's for sure to say no. So I couldn't, but I wanted her to join so bad. And then when she emailed me one day and said, I'm in, I couldn't believe it. And then I was scrambling thinking, oh my goodness, what is she going to do? <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget, I sent her a list of all these ideas that we had. And I was like, you know, they're just ideas. It's like, but what we really need your help on is HR. <laughs> she came in and led her HR people ops and got it off the ground. And now it's an area that we recognize we have to double down our investment in because it's you know so important. And so I love your story and thank you for the way you told it, Nicole, but we wouldn't be where we're at without her joining because she patched up every single hole we had in the boat over and over and over. They weren't always big holes, but they're holes and you can't have that. 
because we're trying to go where we're trying to go and we're trying to get there fast. And you came in here and helped us do that. And I think in terms of the co-CEO, you know, two CEOs, to me, it makes all the sense in the world. We have so much to do, so many decisions that need to be made. How do we build leadership teams that are fully focused on what they're doing to make it happen? And that to me is why we've been able to restructure the organization because it's one eye on today and another eye on 2050. We have a lot to do and we don't have a lot of time to do it. Yeah, I also think, you know, today there's two CEOs, but we're growing and in the future there'll be there'll be more than two CEOs within our umbrella because we we see that this space is really ripe for accelerated growth and in order to do that, you know, appropriately we need to partner and we need to to work with others and that's going to mean probably more joint ventures and more opportunities that's going to be more focused leadership teams. So we, what we're really been focused on and what I'm excited about is how do we create this playbook for how do you start and create a business and a culture that can flourish in this system. And I think the, the whole pathway or journey for me to Puris was probably destined to be, because I had the opportunity to spend time in a company that had really incredible purpose-driven culture and systems that worked really well that I was able to take and bring to Puris, um, you know, tried and true things. And I did, we didn't have to reinvent everything. And, and I had been immersed in a really high-performing, really culture-driven place that and gave me at least some outside opinion on other ways that things can be done. And I think that was helpful. So when you talk about getting to this place, like growing to this place or getting to where you want to go and getting there faster. What does that place look like? How do you define that? Well, you shouldn't ask me that because the place that we're trying to go is always a little bit ahead, um, just based on my personality. But I don't, I don't think we have reached the place because we're looking at 2050, but we also want to make sure that in the here and now, this place is a culture that people want to work work at and feel inspired, you know, to come to work and to, to keep driving forward because this is not easy. What we do every day is it's a grind. I think there's the, if you look in the media, plant-based foods is, is very appealing. It's very exciting, but behind the curtain, it's a grind and it's hard and it's competitive. And we're, we're fighting a, a bit of an uphill battle against, I would say legacy food systems. So you have to be pretty, you have to be pretty invested and passionate to keep doing that. And We've made it, I think, when that is a culture that people uh, really rally around and keep pushing us forward and we keep moving forward. I, I, maybe to add to that, there is no finish line. Where we're going, what does success look like? There is no finish line. It, it's forever, continues, never can stop because food is something that, can we just say, oh, that's enough? We did it good enough? Oh, that's fine. I don't, I think that's the thinking about our business to sports. We don't win a Super Bowl and then, oh, we're done. And I've seen people win Super Bowls and then they're like, well, what's next? So for us, how do we get there? What is it? There's no finish line. It's, it's the pursuit of that ever moving finish line to make the world a better place. And again, this is my dad speaking through me right now. That's him. It's about getting to a, the top of the mountain and building another one and climbing it again and again and again. So I think what does success look like? I don't think we'll ever stop. Well, I guess as an example of that, because Nicole, you talked about where the business started and you know, largely operating in a commodities business. And then Tyler came in and I'd love to kind of dive into, you know, when, when did the conversation around peas get started, you know, and versus where we are today, but is that a conversation that can happen again? Like, can there be another scale oh, for sure. product that, you know, continues to unfold or, or continues to define plant-based nutrition? Because it, it seems like we're just seeing the first few versions of plant-based nutrition now because timing is good. But as far as what it needs to get to mm -hmm. 
at full scale. I think what we're talking about is when you think about feeding people, we're, we're talking about billions of people. Can, can that evolution, like will pee always be here, but will there be another crop that we look to that also solves a lot of the same problems that peas do? I, I think it's certainly possible. But building on the first part of that question on like when did the pea thing start, I think yeah. I get an over levered amount of credit for pushing us into pea protein. And my role was just giving my dad renewed energy around his grand vision. Because what we're doing today is his vision. And then some, there's more to come. Like we're not even close to where he said we need to be. I just was available because I got cut from the NFL to help. And he started breeding peas back in 1999. I'll never forget this. 2004, I'm going to college at Iowa State. And we're, so I, I bred corn every summer, hated it. Absolutely hated it. It's a miserable job. Very hot. You get cut by the corn, sticky, itchy. And now we've been breeding corn for 21 years. We haven't released a corn business unit yet. We've just been investing in the intellectual property, the IP. And when, when you say corn, you're talking about breeding the same way that you breed everything else. Yeah. Like, so non-GMO breeding, all uh, natural breeding methods. Of course, that's, that is rule number one on Empiris' standard. And so I, I give you that context because I bred corn my whole life since I was 12. And as, as we're walking through the field, there's these rows of peas. And they're, grown, they're growing in Oskaloosa, Iowa, which is not where peas grow. They don't flourish in Oskaloosa, Iowa. They're meant to be in Canada. And I'm like, dad, what is this? And he goes, oh, Ty, these are peas. You know, they're gonna be huge. And he starts rattling off all the reasons that they're great for a soil health. They condition the soil and they add nitrogen. And what we're gonna do is we're adapting varieties for further south. Uh, that production will allow farmers to grow them at different times of the year. And if you meet my our dad, when he he's always excited, but when he's in, and around his plants, he's almost like glowing with excitement and opportunity because he, the possibilities he sees are not obvious to a novice like me. He sees different possibilities. So he gets all excited. So fast forward to 2011, and I've been playing in the NFL, trying to convince my weight trainers that soy protein is just as good as whey protein. And they're all telling me it's not. And I'm super frustrated. And so I come back to back home, I actually fly up to Minneapolis, sit down with my dad. He needs help because he's looking to buy a plant in Western Wisconsin. And so we go visit the plant. This is December. And it was a, a dairy plant built in 1950. And it was converted into a soy plant sometime in the 2000s. But it, it, uh, it was shut down, mothballed, and freezing. And it was myself, my best friend, T Money, and my dad. And he, he's walking around, he says, we're buying it. And this was like right before Christmas. So December 27th, we buy the plant with borrowed money from like a Mez lender, super risky. And before that, dad was like, are you in? I was like, look, dad, I'm only in if we go big, but if we're gonna stay small, I gotta do something else. And he goes, let's do it. And so all I was, was the energy for dad to re-go after his vision and fast forward, he wanted to do soy protein. And as a rookie in the industry, myself and Kashal Chandak, who invented all of our products, we were getting smoked trying to sell soy protein. It was so hard, all the big guys were killing us. And I called dad up, I said, you know what? Everything that people complain about soy, what if we use those peas? Non-GMO, organic, hexane-free, it's Google-friendly, soy is not. Where's that P program? And he goes, oh, it's going great. We've kept investing. We've dumped so much money into the program. We're going peas all over the place. We, we patent some, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, dad, I, I think we should pivot and make all pea protein instead of soy protein. And he goes, you're crazy. And I'm like, ah, I really think we should consider it. And he says, if you can make your pea protein taste as good as my soy protein, we can do it. So Kush and I set off and started inventing the product and Kushal did it. 
I just was the encouragement. And I'll never forget, we made a whole slew of products with soy and with pea, uh, with our, our pure SP protein. And I'll never forget, dad was like, you're right, this is better, do it. And we started firing our, our soy customers and they yelled at us because we tried so hard to get them. And then we had to pivot the whole business to pea. And that was in 2014. Uh, when we commercialized our first product and you know now we're the biggest pea protein player in north america arguably the globe building a the best plant you'll, you'll see out in western minnesota so just a lot of cool things and it was all because we could lever that investment back in 1999 when the crazy geneticists committed to breeding a better solution for farmers because it just made sense and yeah so i get over amount of credit but it was really my dad and what, Nicole, maybe you can answer this too, but what's the, what is the thing that's actually driving the adoption of P right now? Like what, what happened to where we did stop looking towards soy and don't get me wrong. Soy is still a, a monumental player inside of plant-based foods. But when we first met, P was not peas and, and pea milk. Like when Tyler was telling me about pea milk for the first time, I was like, that sounds gross. <laughs> you and everyone else said that. Yeah. You know what I, so what happened? Because now to me, and I, it's probably because I'm so close to the, the products, it's very obvious, you know, why, why pea milk is a thing. Um, what, what do you think is creating this change, this momentum driver? Because the, things are changing to where we're not necessarily, you know, you're not having such a hard time selling anymore like you were in the soy business. Mm -hmm. And the, the direction of interest has kind of changed rather than pushing the boulder uphill. It seems like you are fielding a lot more inquiries than, than having to go find. Well, I, th it's a difficult question because I think the, the perception of soy being, you know, not as big of a player is probably not correct. The soy is just a monster in plant-based foods and it continues to grow and there's a lot of production, but what has happened to pea to really, I would say, um, make an inflection point on its adoption. A lot of it goes to the investment in the processing technology to make pea protein taste better. Uh, a lot of the pea protein that was made five years ago was byproducts from pea starch production and it tastes terrible. It's gritty, it's got, it's gray, it doesn't make good food. And so if you eat something with that product, you wouldn't like it. And so it's, it was primarily used in pet food. So the perception back then was, well, why would anyone eat food that's just used for pet food? Like, why would humans eat that? And so that's really a lot of the work that the, the early, I would say, uh, purist pea protein team did was changing that perception. Uh, we always say, you know, the proof is in the pudding, literally making products with RP protein to prove to people that it could taste good because no one believed it because to be fair, most of the products weren't good at the time. And so we had to start, you know, almost one by one changing that perception and showing people the possibilities. Then once you get that possibility into the hands of brands and entrepreneurs and formulators and product developers all across the nation, you start to see this proliferation of awesome products. And you start to see that exponential growth. And I think that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing awesome products come out that are using pea protein because they have better tools in their tool belt. And layer that, all the sustainability benefits, the what Tyler calls Google friendliness of peas and pea protein, there's, there's, a lot of, there's not a lot of reasons why not to if the product tastes great. And what, maybe to kind of keep going on that, just because you talk about soy being a monster, like what is, what, what makes soy the monster versus pea? Like what actually has to happen for there to be more balance? Cause I think what gets me excited is, you know, if we're looking at a decade of innovation in plant-based, just more varieties. So it's not going to be just soy or pea. There will likely be more. And you start to see like little, little inventions, not necessarily like scale manufacturing like these products have, but what, what is next do you think for? Yeah. Well, Tyler could probably answer this better, but just, I think what's challenging the plant protein industry 
is the transformation from crops to usable materials to build food. And that is the ingredient processing step in the middle. This is what Purist Proteins does for pea. But today, I mean, the soy protein industry has been around for, I'm not even sure how long, long time. And the capacity to make soy protein is, I don't know, 10 times more than pea protein, if not more. Yeah, it's, it's about 10x about on 10X, a global basis. And on then- a global basis, like there's just 10 times more soy protein available. And that's I'm estimating ballparking. I'm, don't quote me on that. But it's there's just not as much capacity on the pea protein side. So it's not a level playing field. So it's not that people are choosing soy over pea. Um, they're, the playing field's not level right now. You also look at in the United States, You know, there's 80 million acres of soybeans grown. Uh, most of them are going into animal feed. And so it's, there's just, when you think about soy, soy is everywhere in the United States. And peas are grown heavily in Canada, Northern Plains, and then purist growers are starting to grow them throughout the, the nor- uh, throughout the Midwest, but it's still just a small penetration. So, you know, we see when you think about 2050, how do we really support a global transformation of plant-based proteins? We need the whole supply chain to scale. We need more growers growing crops for human consumption in more places. We need more infrastructure to transform those crops into usable building blocks, whether that's ingredients or the foundation of food products. And then we need that food processing. But that that transformation from crop to building block is so critical in order to turn the plant-based foods into foods that people are used to eating, the textures and and flavor profiles that people are expecting in their food. You need you need that transformation step. And I think that's that's a great way to explain how complicated this is. You know, when I was talking about this idea of feeding people, from what from the perspective, I guess, that I said, it's a balancing act. Like where food has to come from. I heard uh, a, a statistic recently from inside our company. So don't quote me on this. But as far as only about 5% of our like U.S. farmland goes to people food. So when you think about like the the plant-based food economy in in 5%, that seems to be like a staggeringly strange number. When you think about how much plant-based food goes into our bodies and how much you see at the grocery store and walk around to the aisles, it, and then you drive across the Midwest, like to our different facilities, you're driving by stuff just assuming this is all this is all people food. Yeah. Most of the crops, most of the corn and soy that's grown is used for livestock and animal nutrition. A heavy, a large amount of corn goes to ethanol too. So there's a huge chunk, you know, of all of the acres in the United States, the majority of it is corn, soy, and wheat. And so to really make a big dent in the percentage used for human consumption, those three crops have to be kind of very heavily in the mix. But I I think the, you know, feeding people Everything that we've been talking about is really important, but it's even much more complicated than that because it's the the distribution and how do you get the last mile of food? There's it's a very intricate network that we're trying to to solve here, and I think we're we have enough hubris to recognize that we can't do all of that. But the pieces of the puzzle that we're you know targeting and looking at, we're we're trying to do the best job that we can to make it as sustainable as possible and and deliver enough value so that the growers get to participate in the growth too, and that we don't have a, a food revolution that doesn't bring the growers along with it. So navigating this challenging, complicated system, does it, does it help if I'm going to tie this all the way back to how we started this conversation? Does it help knowing that you're going to work, you know, for a really important purpose, one that started within, like that you were essentially born into, and our colleague is also working alongside you. So is that purpose a little bit more than, hmm, how do I, I don't want to say this as like a negative if you're not working within a family business, but I just feel there's got to be some kind of additional drive because you get exposure. I mean, when you come to work, your, your brother sees when you come to work and knows what you're working on and keep it tapped. Family keeps, yeah, family keeps tapped and families, 
critical, but almost more of like a, a rally. Cause I think that's, what's, it's been very, you know, uh, refreshing. So since I started here full time, Nicole, you and I didn't know each other as well, like prior to, um, prior to about a year and a half ago. I, I have been very, very impressed how, you know, you tend to bring in all the good parts of family as far as like the legacy, the focus, uh, the transparency, the openness, like those things, and none of the bad things. Like I actually have no idea what happens in your guys' family. You know, you don't necessarily talk about family things, but when, you know, when Jerry comes by, and this is making me want to get Jerry on this podcast really bad, by the way. <laughs> so that's going to happen. Yep. It Listeners. Should. It may be, it'll be your feature every week once you get him talking because uh, <laughs> it's amazing. But I think that just, you know, when Jerry shows up to the office, the office just feels like a little bit warmer. There's a little bit more excitement, like Jerry's here. Um, do, is that a is that a factor or, or is that like what do you think kind of keeps the the momentum cuz we just experienced a horrible horrible year with the pandemic situation um not just us as like a, a business but it was a very very difficult confusing year mm -hmm. and there was always a factor or a reminder of, or a positive nature, like within the company, there was always transparency and openness talking about how complicated it was. There was no overshadowing or, um, ignoring some of the really, really serious things. And, and we're operating out of Minneapolis. So you can later like that, you know, those elements that happened too, leading up to, you know, the riots or, um, some of the issues that even happened recently with the elections. Like there's a, when you kind of come into the door of Pierce though, it just feels like you are working for like, there's, a, you can feel that legacy that maybe Jerry started, but is so, it? So I, maybe a one way to say this that people could relate is when, when I played sports, that's all I seemingly cared about. And it, and it was, as a football player, you think the world revolves around you and your schedule is, you know, you play on Christmas, whenever. And when I came to Purist, it made me realize how insignificant playing football was. That's when I knew that this is bigger than me. This is bigger than my dad. It's bigger than Nicole, mom, everyone here. This is about shaping what is possible for the future and making it reality because we can so since we can, why not? Like, let's do it. And what I know is true is where this business was founded on was an intention of goodness. And how do we get people to rally together to constantly try to bring that sort of energy to the challenge? Cause it's hard and this every day is not a good day. It's just not. But if you can figure out how to get a team to really be arm in arm, and to have each other's back, it's a, it's a special thing. And I really feel like we're building those blocks here at Purus, and it's only going to gain momentum as we hit full stride. Talk about some of the really hard parts of it. I mean, we were on 24 seven. I mean, someone that I haven't mentioned yet, who probably deserves to be mentioned right out the gate is Rick O'Hara, our COO. You know, when we, we started up Turtle Lake. I'll never forget when we sold our first pallet. We had five employees, you know, one pallet. Now we make, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pallets. Uh, we had to go from five people running the plant when we could, whenever we had an order, to a shift, to two shifts. And then once we got enough demand, we had to run the plant every day of the week, 24-7 all the time. And that's a different thing. Uh, when you go on vacation or whatever, the plant's still moving. It's still happening. And that's complicated. Keeping the lights on, keeping the process going, keeping customers satisfied. You alluded to 
a sum of the demand that we find. We've been sold out for five years in a row and people are like, oh, that's a great problem. Like, no, no, it's a, it's a problem. It's not a great problem, it's terrible actually because every time we slip up, it costs our customers growth. And so what we've been doing is investing to get ahead of the market. So we have line of sight and visibility to keep building it out. So investing in the future before you've proven it today, next thing is hard to raise money. How do you get someone to believe in where you're going when it's not tangible just yet? And you rewind 10 years ago, pea protein was just an idea and we had investors come in and back us. I mean, Vega was our first big customer and Charles Chang, who was a partner at Puris and an investor in our company sold and invested a ton of capital into Puris so we could keep going. And then we knew we needed to build a new plant and go bigger and Cargill said, you know what? We believe in you guys and gave us the capital to grow. And it just keeps happening. One after the other, people believing and enabling because the hard stuff is actually doing it, not just dreaming it up. And that to me is what really is exciting because you start seeing it happen day in and day out. And it's not, it's not Nicole and I, we're not doing it. It's all these other people that have chosen to make this happen and putting the work in. And it's truly, it's truly amazing to watch it go. And that's the hard stuff. Yeah. I, I remember some of the early days at Turtle Lake, some of the stories of our team there and the, our, pro, our group of process engineers at the time were a lot of them just out of school and they were running the plant sometimes 20 hours straight, four hour break, rest, and come back and keep at it. And I think that's the kind of like trial by fire that people went through in the hard times. And, and it creates a little bit of, I think, shared pain because they look at back at those times today and they're like, yeah, remember when we did that? And it's a little badge of honor too. Um, cause we made it through those times now there's, but those times still happen in, in this business. It's, it's an operations business at the end of the day. I think what the world sees is the marketing side of it. Um, but you know, you peel back the the top layer and it's, it's all operations and how do we, how do we run our plants efficiently, keep our people safe. And then you add COVID on top of that and it adds another layer of, of complication and, and risk, but our team manages through it. And it's done a really great job, I think, just keeping the eye on, kind of eye on the end line, which is people need to eat. So our job is to make sure that they can. And, you know, when it comes to all the political discourse, that's one thing that Democrats and Republicans have in common. Everybody eats. And so that's this is kind of grounding factor that in the food industry, we can rise above some of that um, and fulfill what we need to do to keep our economies going. Yeah, and I think. So when you talk about people need to eat, I think 100% agree with you. But the, I think even that's changed at, you know, for the last over the last year, because I think what's being defined now is you know what people need to eat. People's health is the front of the news every single day, and you know even uh, generationally in my family, people are making different kinds of decisions. Decisions I wouldn't have expected my you know, mother or father or aunts and uncles to make, you see products and they're, they're some of my favorite moments when I say, oh, that's one of our products, right? <laughs> we help make that product. Um, and I think that it's just been a, you know, you, you can't really say like silver lining because what we just went through and are still going through is, is really, really difficult. And people are experiencing some real things, but the, the conversation of what's going into our bodies and, and even how that is able to, you know, continue to build better defenses for what we're going through. I think that is a good part of the conversation that's starting to happen. Yeah, I agree. I think the connection of human health and planetary health and soil health is just very early in this in the whole discussion but it's something that's really exciting because there's probably so much more connections to all of these things than we realize and i think that's what makes working at purist and what we do 
something that you can feel good about because we generally believe and feel strongly that the the foods that we're making are checking the boxes of kind of that good food, good for people, good for planet, and are doing right by people and by the, our future generations and really enabling some of these changes to occur. But I think the conversation is still super early and we don't really know um, everything and how it all interplays together, but we're going to learn a lot. And then it's up to us, whether we, us as a people, I guess, uh, whether we're going to respond to that and really make changes because it still comes down at the end of the day to personal choices. Yeah. How does that continue to get figured out though? Like the parts that we don't know because I'm asking a PhD. <laughs> it takes a lot of people doing a lot of research and, and some, and some crazy people who walk around in fields and, you know, look at plants like Jerry does to, to have insights that maybe those of us who spend a lot of time staring at computers don't have the ability to do, but it's, it's going to take a collection of people looking for those connections and willing to maybe unlearn what we think we know, the conventional wisdom and take a fresh perspective at these things and, and not necessarily go forward with the belief that everything that we've done in the past is the right, th the right way that we have to be open to saying, well, maybe, maybe we do need to make some adjustments. Um, and I think we're there. I think there's a lot of people who are thinking like that. And so the, the science is coming, the willingness to, to learn and pivot is, is there at some, in some levels, it, but it'll take some time. Yeah. I think overall the disconnect on where your food comes from and why that matters and ultimately the outcomes that could be our future based on those lack of understanding and ignorance is very costly. And the pandemic has highlighted that more than anything in my lifetime. And it's finally got people speaking about it or questioning or at least having curiosity on more than just a label or a certi certification or this fad diet or that. It's asking some basic questions on, well, why did we do it that way? And when you start unpacking it, people are shocked and they just don't know. And the more curious, the more information that consumers can have and ask, the more one branches celebrate that because those are the, those are the, those are the customers you want. And, and two, it's going to give opportunity to rewrite the future because we have the ability to do it, but it's going to take everyone to actually do it versus hold on to ways of the past. And I think the, the pandemic, there's so many terrible things and it plays into every social issue, every political issue, no matter how you cut this conversation up, the pandemic plays a role in everything. And it absolutely plays a role in the future of our food. Yeah, and you, you said something, I think really important, but it requires a lot of unpacking as far as people don't know uh, where it comes from. It's, you know, I think there was a lot of trust. If you look at the last 60 years of, how the grocery store evolved. It was built on trust. 60 years ago, you would go to the grocery store and you knew who owned it, for example. Um, there was a relationship there. Mm -hmm. And also if you go, you know, decade or two before, we required that trust because we were experiencing wars. Like we had, our attention was elsewhere. Um, we still had to eat though, right? So that trust developed and we became busier. Like if, you, if you look at anybody in any, in any lifestyle, they, we are busy. And we don't know because I think we, we still hold that trust, that expectation that if I go to the store, the thing that label is labeled that it's good for me is good for me. Well, Chad, I think it's, it's that, but we also go to the store expecting that it's there there's people that are alive today where that wasn't always the case. And there's places right now in this moment in time that food isn't readily available. Like the, our perception of food and having access to food in America is, is not like the rest of the world. And the pandemic has shown fragility of supply chains for sure, where people show up to stores and what they expect to buy is not 
actually there. Yes, I agree with you 100% about trust. And I think the the end, the advancement of the outcome is when, really when people start breaking down, well, why do we eat meat? The common answer, I need its protein. Well, where did the meat get its protein? I've never thought about that. And you start basically figuring out, oh, animals ate plants. Oh, plants have protein? And you start thinking, well, how ridiculous is that, that we're feeding all of this, all of this protein to an animal to just feed us the same thing that we claim to need from, from that animal. And to me, that's some of the questions that people are starting to ask because we've just taken it for granted because food has been accessible and cheap for Americans for my whole life. And that, you know, looking back into this earlier this century, I mean, a hundred years ago, there was like 4 billion less people that there's on the planet today. Maybe a little bit more than that. And you fast forward 30 years from now, there's going to be another 2 billion people and we have to figure out systems that work to feed people, both the planet and people in a way that works for everyone. And it's really important. We make that happen fast. So when you're talking about feeding people in Puris, you're just to kind of clarify, you're talking about solving all the problems you just brought up as far as access to food and not necessarily just locally or domestically. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it's important that food needs to be affordable and accessible. I agree with that. And that in certain places it is today, but we're not looking at the total cost of food. And that's when you start looking at human health outcomes, planetary health outcomes, and all of these things that are tied into what is the real cost of the food that we're eating and consuming and then thinking about, well, how does that work for a place where food isn't affordable and accessible? I heard an example, uh, they were talking about cryptocurrency and they were saying, well, you know, places that don't have a central bank today will, will not go and have a central bank. They'll skip and go to some sort of digital currency. And they compared it to cell phones, places that do not have uh, landlines, today, they're not going to get a landline and have that technology for a while and then graduate to cell phones. They're going to skip that and go directly to cell phones. So I, I see there's a huge opportunity here where emerging markets can go from not eating meat to eating meat, but just from plants instead of eating meat from animals, then graduating to eating meat from plants. Because the first time in history, places like the United States and Europe you're seeing more affluent cultures addressing these problems and starting eating protein from plants at a greater rate of growth than uh, animal nutrition. First time in history has happened and it's important. It's even happening in China. And that to me is a great indicator of the leapfrog event that could happen to how we feed the world. And Jerry calls it protein independence, but this ability to grow and feed your people regionally. So what are the projects you're working on, Nicole, that get to that protein independence? So one of the new joint ventures that we just announced actually today publicly is- Congratulations. Thank you. Um, lots of big team effort on that one. But it is in partnership with Live Kindly where we're taking our purest uh, pea genetics. So the peas that Tyler was talking about that Jerry's been working on since 1999 and we're taking them to South Africa to grow them on sugarcane fields. That ha uh, fields have been growing sugarcane for years. The sugarcane market is, is not as attractive as it once was. The, the fields, soils very depleted, can't grow a lot of crops, and they're looking for, for new solutions on ways to drive, I would say, just um, agricultural resilience, soil health, but also have markets. And so we're, we're taking peas there to to really prove out that they can work in these different climates, but then, but really ultimately laying the foundation for this concept of protein independence. How can we grow crops in other regions and then apply the work to really transform those crops into food? And 
it's uh, it's not an overnight solution for sure, and we're not claiming that to be. But we're we're starting where we believe is like the first ground level step, which is you got to grow the, the grow the crops. We want to make sure we believe, and, and Jerry's vision has always been that regions can and should be self sufficient. They should be able to feed themselves without having to rely on on other countries and other regions to provide for them. And in order to do that, you have to have crops that can grow in a very diverse climates, especially with the weather, the extreme weather that we have, you know, lately, um, you have to have very resilient crops. And that's what, what we've been able to develop. And we want to take those crops and take them globally so that other farmers in other regions have access to, to crops like this that can grow their bottom line and help feed uh, their friends and family. That's... So when you talk about the partnership with Live Kindly and, and kind of starting with the growth, it seems like they are, they seem to value the same thing that you and Jerry do as far as, you know, protein independence is the long game. Like, yeah, I think that's the key, the key factor for, for us in like mission alignment is where are you looking? Are you looking for a, a two year exit? Um, okay, that's fine. But that's not where we're looking. We're looking at, you know, how do we feed people in 2050 in you know, 2100? How do we start laying those foundational elements so that the world can feed itself when we're dead and gone? Um, and it, it takes like it's a transformation. And the amount of investment in infrastructure is mind blowing. It's it's dollar figures that I can't quite like grapple with in my head. And that's a problem for, you know, a lot of people to solve the, the big food and ag companies in the world are going to need to solve it. The little guys are going to need to solve it. Tyler, his purest proteins company needs to solve it. And purest holdings. We want to make sure that those building blocks are there, that the agriculture systems are set up for success so that there is the infrastructure to really support the, or there's the crops to support the infrastructure. And then we have to work with all sorts of companies and brands throughout the, the world to build the demand so that we can really scale uh, this food system because it's going to take effort from now until really for the next 50, 60 years to get there because the amount of change needed is pretty dramatic uh, to really be able to feed people more sustainably. So last question, just so that we can uh, get ready for work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And this this isn't necessarily saying uh, wind it down, but you can you can take as long to answer this as as you want. But what's the to help? I think to help people kind of understand the differences or the interconnectedness of the companies within Purus. What's the hardest thing that you know? I guess each one of those companies, Purus Proteins and then Purus Holdings, like what's the hardest thing that you're looking to accomplish? you know, in the next 24 months. So we're building a, a new facility in Dawson, Minnesota, and that is the obvious answer for sure. That what, what makes that the obvious answer that we are starting up a new plant and, you know, scaling it up and there's very long list of items that you have to do to make this happen. We bought it in 2018 and did uh, two years worth of engineering and financing and all the steps it takes to get a project off the ground. And we really had a vision that we could repurpose infrastructure that was left to dust. Uh, this was a facility that again, was a dairy facility that was no longer was going to run. It's lived this life. And we took the time to, to reuse the infrastructure to redesign our process to put into the building. And it was a lot of work. Uh, we were excited about it for a number of reasons. And as you think about 24 months from now, we very well may do it again. And to me, that is the pressure we're putting on ourselves is how do we scale up even further so we can enable more people to shift the food that they, ate, they eat and enable these brands to grow because they shouldn't make a compromise when choosing the types of ingredients that are putting in their food because people are willing and able to experience something that is no compromise to conventional proteins. And I think that's what plant-based needs to do. So the next 24 months, it's making sure that facility 
happens so we can set ourselves up to do it again. I think for the Pierce Holdings business, there's kind of two sides, two sides. There's the ag, the ag tech side. So the work we're doing in the agriculture and food tech on the agriculture side and the next 24 months, we need to really refine and, and have a scaled model for how we can support farmers more often in their cropping systems. So right now we work with farmers on pea and soy, but there's, there's a lot of rotations where we're not a part of the equation and we want to be able to provide more um, kind of all around support for farmers. So working with them on multiple crops, on carbon scoring and, and carbon offsets, more risk management, all different ways that we can support them to really help farmers who are looking to move into different um, models of agriculture, help them make that transition. So I think there's the, and we need to scale. We need to grow more peas and more places to really support the growth of purist proteins. On the food tech side, we need to continue to drive innovation and really support one, support brands who are entering the space, help them scale and solve problems in scaled manufacturing where needed. And two, there's a big challenge in underutilized parts of the plant protein supply chain. So the, the you call it waste or co-products or byproducts, whatever you want to call it, about 20% of the crops aren't used for food. And, and we need to solve that. 20%. Yep. And so we need to solve that because we're going to, this industry is going to grow and it's going to scale. And if that problem is not solved, the problem will scale right alongside of it. And so we need to solve it now. All right. What's the biggest challenge you need to solve? I think we should always get to ask you a question. That's mine. I'm time. the moderator. I think the biggest challenge that I'm working to solve within this company is it's going to be to fall on the ag tech side. It's, it's building a safety net, safety net for growers. Like I want to, I want the transition to, you know, from GMO to non GMO to make sense clearly. Um, I want that road to be clear. And then from non GMO to organic, we need the economics there. So for the next 24 months, that's, that's a huge part of my focus, like defining what that safety net looks like and building it. Yeah, I think that's a great, great point. Cause on the organic side, I think that's a challenge too, is how do we continue to build a market that really supports a US organic farmer and, and values that so that we can not, not just provide a pathway to how do you grow organic, but how do we market and merchandise organic crops domestically too? I think that's a, it's a big challenge and a big problem that that's the, in the here and now. And I'd love to solve it way before 24 months, but it's, honestly, it's probably going to take at least that long to solve it. Good question, Tyler. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to conclude our first podcast. I think that was somewhat successful. Our audience will let us know. I'll provide some commenting. I feel, I hear a faint round of applause. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you, Thank Chad. You.